that's happened in their neighborhoods, they don't like it. How can we stop it? Well, again, it's uh, being imposed from the top down. So in many ways, fighting back is a bottom-up proposition. It's telling your county commissioners, your city council folk, that you don't want this. Because this is a directive. People have right. to understand it's a directive. That means we're not forced to do it, and the DOT isn't forced to right. do it. It's, it's supposed to be voluntary. It's supposed to be communities can choose to adapt it. And, and even within the directive, there's supposed to be a number of exceptions that are to that rule. Like nobody's saying, do this in interstates, or nobody's saying, do this Yet. where it's prohibitively expensive. But of course, who's to define prohibitive? But there have been a couple of examples where people have pushed back, and North St. Paul is a very good example, where they came up with a project along 15th Avenue, and it would cover five blocks. The residents along that avenue found out that they were going to be assessed anywhere from $50 to $60 per foot along the frontage to pay for part of the project, and then would have the ongoing responsibility of taking care of sidewalks throughout the winter and decided they didn't want that and they pushed back and the city council went and reversed the vote and voted four to one not to go ahead. But they made it clear that the city is still committed to complete streets as a concept and so they'll be looking for another project, hopefully one and from their point of view that won't generate the opposition. But that's usually where the pushback comes, where a specific project gets uh, proposed and then and then at only at that point do the homeowners get asked well what do you think and here's what we're decided we're going to do in your neighborhood and here's how much you'll have to pay for it then you start to see some of the pushback and so what folks need to do is pay attention because cities that haven't adopted it are having open houses or they're having city council meetings where this will be on the agenda and the advocates will be there in fact the advocates pride themselves on being able to deliver bodies to events where this is going to be discussed. And so it'll look to the media, it'll look to the elected officials as if there's overwhelming support for the set of policies, when in fact it just shows the organizational skill of the advocates. So if you see your city is going to have a, a hearing on complete streets or it's on an agenda item, it would be a really good idea to stand up and ask everybody to tell what city they're from. Mm -hmm. That'd because, be very interesting because because then they'd be able to it's say probably likely there are very few from that community exactly because it's so important that the people actually show up at the city council meeting or at the county commissioner meeting to put a stop to whatever this is but you also have to expose the organization that's working against the property owner mm -hmm. and these organizations are very well organized and very well funded who funds them well uh, you is the short answer uh, transit for livable communities has a staff of 13 paid employees. They, ha they are administering a $28 million grant from the U U.S. Department of Transportation. So it's a seven-year grant, $4 million a year, and it's a nonprofit organization administering federal tax dollars, and they're doling it out to communities to pay for different projects. They also get funding from foundations and other private sources of income, such as the McKnight Foundation. The McKnight Foundation has been funding transit for livable communities with $125,000 a year going back to 2005. So every year they get uh, a slug of money from the McKnight's. They're administering the federal grant. And so they end up with an annual budget for 2009 of $1.7 million supporting wow. those 13 full-time employees. So these folks have time to do the organization, to get the word out, to create marketing materials and appear in newspapers and other shows other than yours to promote these ideas. Complete Streets is just one of the programs that right. are, they're funding and operating. But interestingly enough, this is not just a Minnesota phenomenon. There's these organizations all over the country, and there's a national coalition for complete streets. One of their largest funders, oddly enough, is Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. So really? Our state Blue Cross is one of the founders and, and lead funders of the national complete streets coalition. That is really strange. Maybe I should be making phone calls to Blue Cross Blue Shield. They seem to have their tentacles in a lot of things, too, now that I think about it. All right, so Complete Streets, um, what, else, what else does it include? We talked about the calming. We talked about making the road smaller so that the bicycles and the pedestrians can all coexist together. Mm -hmm. That was the part that bothered me so much. They would take a four-lane road 
and they'd cut it down and there'd be one lane of automobile traffic going each direction and then sidewalks and then bike bikers. Well, let's take the North St. Paul project as, a, as an example because it contains just about every element that's typically included in a complete streets project. And the part that you're going to like the most is the allocation of space for public art. So that's oh. part of it. So public art, uh, putting aside space for that along the complete streets route. But yes, you described a, a fairly typical project of taking a four lane road where you have two lanes of traffic in each direction with parking on the sides along the curb and converting that into two lanes of traffic, one in each direction, where another lane is dedicated to bike traffic, bicycle traffic, and then what was the fourth lane becomes a space for what they call rainwater gardens. Uh, small patches of vegetation and, and soil that are designed to uh, take the rainwater out of the, of the wastewater stream and out of going into the rivers and lakes. And so we have four lanes, two lanes, bike lane, and then rainwater gardens, and the parking just gets lost in the shuffle. Right. And I think the residents were furious about the parking, but they were even more furious about the rainwater collection. <laughs> right. It, uh, some people don't think they're very attractive they're as, not. as landscaping <laughs> elements. and uh, They breed mosquitoes and the kids mess around in them. And yeah, that, that was what I think ultimately the, the residents said, okay, we've had it. <laughs> but my least favorite complete streets project has to be what they've done to First Avenue in Minneapolis. Ah, uh, yes. Where you go to a, uh, something at the Target Center or a baseball game at Target Field along First Avenue, they've taken again what was a four-lane traffic situation with parking on the sides, they've converted the curbside lane to bicycle traffic and moved the parked cars to the middle of the road. So you have cars parking in the middle of what used to be the driving lanes. And it, and it is the middle of the road. I was just down there. It is the middle of the road. And then in Minneapolis, there's another project they're working on called the Bryant Avenue Bicycle Corridor, where they want to have bicycles and automobiles share what's now the middle of the road. So the, that middle lane of traffic, they're going to have shared between bicycles and automobiles. Well, obviously, if you're driving in an automobile, you'll have to slow down to accommodate whatever bicycle traffic is in the road as well. But again, as we were talking about earlier, do you have uh, encounters between bicycles and automobiles? Because not just are you sharing the same right of way inside the road, uh, but you're sharing the same lane of traffic. 